Good afternoon, delegates, and a very warm welcome to the 87th Annual National SNP Conference. I know that we're in for a few days of fantastic discussion and debate, and for a brilliant way to start that off, we have with us Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans and our SNP Deputy Leader, Keith Brown, MSP. Welcome, Keith. Delegates, members and friends, welcome to the 87th SNP Annual National Conference. I dearly wish I was welcoming you all in person to shake hands with fellow members and activists, to warmly embrace old friends and long-time comrades in our pursuit of independence, to share old stories, remember absent friends, and when the day's work is done, to raise a glass in their memory. But while this dreadful pandemic has loosened some of its grip on the nation, we are far from being out of the woods yet. And that means the opportunity to meet once again in person is simply not entirely safe while we wrestle to control this dreadful disease. As we move into the challenging winter period, I'd like to pay testimony to the NHS staff, the care workers, emergency services workers, all the key workers, and their fantastic colleagues working in vital council services right across Scotland. It's their commitment and selflessness that's helped us all during this pandemic. And we can all have faith that those on whom we have relied during these difficult months will continue to give their all to protect us and our loved ones. So friends, we meet again in the virtual world, and I'd like to take the opportunity also to thank all the staff across the party who have worked so hard to put this conference together. Once again, we're using the hop in platform, and I hope you will hop in for the full conference all the way right through to the First Minister's keynote address on Monday. We have great speeches from Deputy First Minister John Swinney and our Westminster leader, Ian Blackford, who faces Boris Johnson down every week at Westminster. And conference comes to a close with the much anticipated address from our party leader, Nicola Sturgeon. As well as speeches, our agenda is packed full of resolutions for debate, and I'll be looking forward to much lively discussion across these next four days. Regular attendees of virtual conference will be happy to know that by popular demand, the much loved blether function returns, where you can virtually catch up with the friends that you can't see in real life. So please hop in and say hello. Friends, the SNP gathers this weekend in great shape, but also with great resolve. The last couple of years have been challenging for all of us, and they've made us all think about what really matters in our lives. As a responsible government, the SNP's first priority has been, and remains, steering Scotland safely through the pandemic. While the whole Westminster system is quite clearly broken beyond repair, we are focused on delivering for the people in every part of Scotland. And as we look to the future, we'll urge the people of Scotland to think about what kind of country they want to live in when the pandemic is over. Who's best placed to make decisions affecting their lives? Who is most committed to making Scotland a fairer, more prosperous nation and tackling key issues like the climate emergency? And we will not allow Scotland's future to be limited by the relentless negativity, the can't-do attitude, and the complete lack of vision from the Unionist parties. Our case for Scotland's future is one based on optimism and ambition, a belief that our nation has what it takes to be a successful, independent nation, and a belief that the people who live here can take better decisions about their lives rather than leaving it to Westminster. That's the case we will make in the months ahead, and that's the case which will lead us to independence. Friends, earlier this year, we witnessed a Scottish Parliament election of genuinely historic significance, and you all played a crucial role. While I can't ask the conference hall to show its appreciation for your hard work and commitment, let's at least give ourselves a big virtual round of applause. And the result of your endeavours delivered a result which was quite simply stunning. No party has ever received more votes. No party has ever received a larger share of the vote for a Holyrood election. And despite the combined efforts of the pro-union forces ranged against us, you returned 64 MSPs to Parliament, despite the system being set up specifically to prevent such a result. 
but because of the incredible dedication of every branch, of every member and every activist, you helped deliver an historic fourth term for the SNP and once again secured Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister. And more than that, you delivered an undeniable mandate for a new independence referendum. People have put their trust in us as a government through this pandemic, and they've demonstrated that trust at local level. And now we must aim to replicate our holiday triumph with equal success in next year's local government elections. And I know that once again, we can count on our army of activists to get out the SNP vote to deliver another thumping election result and another big step on our journey to independence. And friends, I can tell you this, that independence campaign is well underway. And I promise you, we will not let up until we win that referendum. The last time I addressed conference, I urged everyone to reach out for Indy. And we know that to win a referendum on independence, we must reach out to undecided voters. And we are strengthening relationships with others in the Yes movement to unite behind our campaign. That's why this month we embarked on the first of a series of bold initiatives to deliver our message to those who are yet to be convinced. The SNP teamed up with our Green Party allies in government. The organisation Believe in Scotland and The National, unbelievably, still the only newspaper in Scotland to support independence. And together we produced, printed and distributed our own newspaper to help build the case for independence. By St Andrew's Day, this coming Tuesday, that newspaper will have been delivered to one million homes across Scotland. Our ambition is only surpassed by the commitment of you, our members and activists, whose hard work pounding the streets is making our ambition a reality, letterbox by letterbox by letterbox. Friends, just two months ago, back in September, our First Minister made a hugely significant announcement. The Scottish Government is resuming its crucial work on an updated and detailed prospectus for independence. And that new government work will be essential to help voters make their fully informed choice, and we await the delivery of that new prospectus with eager anticipation. Meanwhile, our combined task is clear. We must bring to life our vision of a better, fairer, more sustainable Scotland. The pandemic has shown everyone what really matters and what kind of country we want Scotland to be. We must strive to deliver a society where no one needs worry about having a safe place to live, where no one need worry about feeding themselves and their families, where as prices continue to rise and rise, no one worries about paying their heating bills during the coming cold winter, where employment and education are there for all, where we know that if a loved one falls ill, our NHS will be there to care for them, and where the key workers are not given the bare minimum but are rewarded and recognised for their contribution to our society. We need a society that looks after its older people. And independent Scotland must and will offer better than the poverty pensions of the UK. To match our world-leading ambitions to combat global climate change, we need a just transition to a cleaner environment. And we need independence to invest in our bountiful renewable energy resources, which are the envy of Europe. The future of our planet depends on it, and it's far too important to be left to the Tories. And conference, never forget what Westminster control means for Scotland. Westminster control means the northeast of Scotland is overlooked for investment in crucial carbon capture projects. Westminster control means pork barrel politics, where cash that should come to Scotland is diverted to shore up Tory votes in England. And only by becoming an independent country can Scotland rid itself of Westminster control. Conference earlier this month, the world's eyes were on Scotland as Glasgow hosted COP26. And the world was not slow in telling us they loved what they saw. Through the exemplary leadership of First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, we were given a tantalising preview of how the world will welcome Scotland to the top table of nations of this world. But to do that, and to do it properly, we need so much more than the constraints of the union can offer. We need our independence. And of course, I don't need to convince you of that. But working together, we must continue to win over our fellow Scots who are not yet convinced. And we can convince them with the power of our positive vision. 
we can convince them that in an independent Scotland, everyone's basic needs are met as a right and are no more at the mercy of the Westminster elite. An elite who, of course, have trashed the UK's global reputation. An elite which has presided over increasing inequality and an utterly unbalanced economy that prioritises London and the southeast of England over all other parts of the UK. Delegates, we can do so much better than this. Scotland deserves better than this. Never before in our history have so many people in Scotland joined our common cause. We now share our belief that independence is the correct future for our country. And to all those who have recently joined the party, on behalf of all in the SNP, let me say welcome and thank you. You've joined us on the march to independence and there is much to do. Our combined goal is to continue to build sustained majority support for independence. Coupled with the cast iron mandate delivered in May and another thumping triumph in the council elections this coming May, we will continue to pile the pressure on the UK government over our legitimate demand for a referendum. The Johnsons and the Goves of Westminster know they can't stand in the way of the democratic will of Scotland. And what we do know is that Boris Johnson always bows to pressure. Just look at the scandalous Owen Paterson affair. The Prime Minister's actions, as always, speak far louder than his words. When the Prime Minister had to choose between protecting the integrity of elected office or protecting his friend, he chose to change the rules to protect a colleague. And then when the pressure came on again, he caved in and once again U-turned. And meanwhile, Scottish Tory leader Douglas Ross claims our party is out of touch with working class communities in Scotland. And then we learn he forgot to declare £30,000 in earnings, a sum far greater than the average Scot earns in an entire year. So tell us again, Mr Ross, who is it that's out of touch? Friends, the simple truth is that the Tories don't care about Scotland. They don't care about working class people. They don't care about those whose universal credit they cut by £20 a week. They don't care about those who lost their jobs when they prematurely ended furlough. They don't care about those left battling an inhumane immigration system that prevents people taking jobs in businesses, screaming out for workers because of the Tory Brexit obsession. And Scotland needs to escape all of this. And Scotland, not Boris Johnson, must decide Scotland's future. Of course, Westminster will employ every underhand trick in the book to try to frustrate us. But there's no better argument than winning over the people of Scotland, whose voices will always trump Boris Johnson's. And to do that, we must be the best we can be. We need to be tolerant. We need to be kind, inclusive, open, honest and engaged. And we need to keep doing what our leader Nicola Sturgeon has been doing so brilliantly, demonstrating day in and day out that we are and we will be better governed if we take our own destiny into our own hands. And I believe we can realise those ambitions by showing tolerance, even kindness, while holding fast, of course, to our belief that independent Scotland will flourish through the rewards of our combined endeavours. And friends, I've said it before, but we stand on the shoulders of giants and it falls to us to build on the legacy of those who campaigned before us, whose efforts in building support for independence has already taken us so far. And we have to engage with the no voters of today if we are to deliver the yes voters of tomorrow. And believe me, friends, there is an undeniable renewal of national pride blowing through Scotland. The prize is there for the winning. It's up to us to reach out and to grasp it. And one final thought, friends, as we go into a conference which unusually is happening very close to Christmas. Many of us are striving for what we believe will be the perfect Christmas, making sure we have the perfect Christmas dinner, the perfect presents for our friends, in order to make up for a really tough two years. But striving for that perfect Christmas can put real pressure on individuals. So I'd just like to say what is most important about this Christmas, and that's to make sure we all make it through Christmas safe and well. So as the First Ministers continually remind us, make sure we do the basics, make sure we get vaccinated, make sure you get your booster jab, make sure you test yourself regularly, and make sure we follow the basic measures that we know can get us through this COVID crisis. And if we do that, then the best and most perfect Christmas present we can have is to make sure we're all here again next Christmas safe and well, 
and ready to carry forward the fight for our country's independence. Thank you, delegates. Thank you very much, Keith. What a fantastic speech and what a start to conference that was. And with that, let's get down to business. So my name is Kirsten Oswald and I am the business convener and I'm joined on the virtual stage by National Secretary Stuart Stevenson. And we'll be here on screen to guide you through the programme during conference. And on screen, you will also see Bruce doing sign language interpretation today. And we have subtitling on screen too from Andrew and Heather. So our first order of business for today is to deal with the report of the conferences committee and our standing orders for conference. And for that, I will hand over to the National Secretary. So over to you, Stuart. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Convener. Um, the conferences committee, of course, is responsible for uh, concluding what uh, of those motions and amendments that branches and others have submitted uh, should appear on the agenda. And this isn't a, a trivial operation for the committee. It involves a great deal of work and a great deal of thinking. But it also is very important for the politics uh, that we espouse. Uh, in 2007, I had the great privilege to be appointed a minister in our first government. And the first thing I did was to dig out all the motions that related to my policy area, 56 pages of them, and they drove what I did as a minister. So this is not an abstract thing. What we're doing at conference and what the conference committee is given responsibility of leading for uh, is very important to the party and to Scotland. Uh, I must say, as I retire as National Secretary, um, this is a very significant month for me. This is the month in which I have achieved 60 years uh, of members of the party. So you'll forgive me if I'm going back to the less stressful endeavour of pounding the streets, delivering newspapers, engaging uh, with people to persuade them uh, that it's time uh, to support the independence movement uh, that will deliver so much uh, for our country. The Conferences Committee uh, has done uh, what it can. Uh, I think it's done a, a very good job, and I thank all the members, uh, particularly those who are standing again. I take no position on who should be elected, uh, but uh, I hope you'll participate in the election uh, for that committee and everyone else. The important thing I must end with here procedurally, however, that allows our conference to proceed is I invite you to support the, the standing orders. I move the standing orders for this conference of the SNP. Thank you very much for that, Stuart. So delegates, with that, um, let's vote on the standing orders and um, thank you, Stuart, for the report of the Conferences Committee. Now, when we come to votes, you will see voting buttons appear on the right hand side of your screen, or if you're on a tablet or iPad, you may see that button appearing at the bottom of your screen. So if you can locate your voting button now and we'll vote on the report of the Conferences Committee and these standing orders. Thank you.
Thank you very much, delegates, and thank you for participating in that important vote. Uh, and the report of the Conferences Committee and the standing orders for this conference pass overwhelmingly by 370 votes for to eight against. And that's good news because it means that we can now move on with conference and the resolutions that you have submitted. And the first of these, uh, resolution number one, is entitled Financial Equality for Women. And that resolution is proposed by Anne Rendell of Dundee West Branch and seconded by Anne Porter of Dundee East Branch, who is a first time speaker at conference. So welcome to them both. Good afternoon, conference. In proposing this motion, I would like firstly to commend the party for putting forward plans and policies which are preparing our country for independence. Those plans include positive efforts to make things better for women in Scotland, including a commitment to incorporating into Scots law the European Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. But right now in our country, despite efforts to close it, the gender pay gap continues to have a huge impact on a woman's earnings throughout her working life. 85% of women will be bear children, and that single act means they can expect to be one third poorer for the rest of their lives. I just pause to let that sink in. It's hard to comprehend that even with the various laws which are in place now, including the Equality Act of 2010, women returners still face discrimination and unfair practices at work. Childbirth has a massive effect on women, and yet we appear not to recognise the vital role played by women both to society and to the economy. Why should that be the case? Statistics seem to show that women going into the, the workforce appear now to have more chance of starting their working lives on an equal footing with men. But it's when they leave to have children that things go wrong. For many women, Having a baby represents the biggest financial blow they will suffer over their lifetime. The opportunity cost that having a child has on women's pay packets, pensions and career prospects are hiding in plain sight and we need to call out the causes and not the symptoms of the continuing financial inequality suffered by the 52% of our population who are women. Part-time work, paternity leave and expanded childcare attempt to mitigate, but don't address the root cause of why women are poorer. This resolution asks the party to recognise that it is women who bear children, women who mainly stay at home to look after them. Again, mainly women who come out of the workforce to care for elderly parents or who become kinship carers for other family reasons. Must we accept that they will be poorer financially, potentially suffer poorer health, and eventually end up being poorer in retirement as well. We think it's time to agree that this status quo is not acceptable. If we are to redress the mistakes of the past, the lessons learned from history must be taken into account before we can enable positive change for our future. It is our belief that what would make things better for women and thus help to secure the country's financial well-being is a radical rethink of the way we view, acknowledge, and recognize all those roles that women take on. It is our firm and informed belief that in order to secure the country's economic stability and financial well being, we need to overhaul historic and systemic practices and eradicate all ill conceived and discriminatory views which constrain the futures of women in Scotland. We need a thoughtful examination as to why leaving the workforce albeit for a temporary period, and for any of the, the reasons outlined, makes women poorer. We need to find out why women returners accept and often expect lesser roles and poorer paid work. We must find a way to hear their voices. The First Minister established the National Advisory Group on Women and Girls so that the voices of women can be heard at the highest level about the inequalities they still face every day and it has supported the WASPI women's fight over the unfair changes to state pension age. The party has also taken positive steps, such as cancelling the interest on student loans during maternity leave, 
and continuing funding for women returners to help them back to work. These are commendable. However, the big issues of why women continue to be economically poorer need a much bigger focus if we are to have a growing economy here in Scotland, which will support it when it takes its place as an independent country. There needs to be an open and honest assessment of the shortfalls within employment and the wider establishment, which women have had to endure. Only by assessing the true value of women's unpaid domestic labour to the country can we begin to recognise its value to the wealth and prosperity of our nation. This resolution asks that the party listen carefully to the voices of women of my generation and give assurance that women of the future are treated with both fairness and dignity, liberating their potential, growth and status. I commend the resolution to conference. Good afternoon. Uh, women who are now in their 60s and 70s were the first generation to shoulder the double burden of unpaid domestic work and paid work outside the home in greater numbers than ever before. We were pioneers. When we were younger, we believed, or we were led to believe, that we could have it all. Now, looking back, we realise that many of us actually worked an um, exhausting double shift. Um, we always knew combining food and paid work, fulfilling paid work, was going to be difficult, but we, we just didn't realise how difficult it was going to be. The results are not good. Um, there's a wealth of data that shows older women are significantly poorer than men the same age. There's also a wealth of data that shows that the pay gap for young mothers today widens to 40% across the first 10 years of motherhood. Clearly, something has to change. We should applaud the Scottish Government's plans to move away, or at least to move away as far as possible, from the limitations of the 2010 Equality Act. Development plans for Scotland's very own human rights framework will give us an opportunity to do things differently in ways that are fair to everyone. Older women, who are often taken for granted, have a very important role to play in this. If we are to build a prosperous Scotland of the future, and if we are to address serious demographic challenges ahead, then we will have to find fundamentally different solutions to the problem of this financial inequality. By harnessing the insights of older women, who learned lessons the hard way, and by capturing relevant data, facts and figures for mothers of this generation, facts and figures which are pretty thin on the ground at the moment, then inevitably we will reach a better understanding about the underlying root causes of financial inequality for women. This in turn will put us in a position where we can find next generation solutions that will make a difference. So I am delighted to second this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much to both Anne's. Um, and our next speaker delegates who is speaking in favour of the resolution is Kirsty Blackman MP. So welcome to Kirsty. Good afternoon conference. It's really awesome to be here speaking, albeit to a virtual conference. Um, the ironic thing about me speaking is I thought I might miss this debate because I've got to go and pick up the children from school, um, but thankfully managed to catch it. Um, just to build on some of the things that have been said earlier, it, it absolutely is the case that there is a pay gap um, when women have children. The really horrendous thing about it is that during that same period of time, during that time when I'm um, after having children, men's pay increases during that, that period of time. So, you know, it is absolutely um, on the shoulders of women this. I think it's really important that when we hear this, um, when we develop the human rights framework, we hear the voices of all, um, particularly because there are 
so many lived experiences and so many voices that we don't necessarily hear. We often don't hear older women speaking in public life. It's just not the case. In fact, we often don't hear young women speaking in public life either. But older women's voices are especially um, uh, ignored and drowned out when it comes to the some of the higher echelons. You just have to look at um, Westminster and some of the people that you see standing speaking, particularly on the Tory sides to see that the voices of older women is simply not there. Um, the other couple of things I wanted to add was about part-time work. It is the case that part-time work should not be penalised. Whether you are a part-time worker because you are an unpaid carer, whether because you are a woman, whether you've got childcare responsibilities, whether you're a disabled person, part-time work comes with a major penalty and a likelihood that you're not going to get promoted at the same rate as your full-time colleagues. And that should not be the case. The last thing I want to say is my great granny lived till she was 99 and she used to say, all age does not come at cell. Now, she was talking about the negative connotation. She was talking about her creaky joints and stuff. But the reality is that for her, old age didn't come itself. And for so many, every woman that I've met, it also comes with a huge amount of experience. It comes with a huge amount of lived experience. And it's something that we need to listen to. We need to ensure that um, that Scotland is a better place, that Scotland is a fairer place, not just for those younger women who are coming through, who are going to be having children, who are going to be raising families and becoming unpaid carers, but also for those people who are currently in the bracket of older women. This is not just a problem for the future that we're looking to solve. This is a problem that we're looking to make better today as well. So we need to improve this financial inequality. We need to do it now and we need to do it for everybody. And one of the best ways to do that is by listening to the lived experience that older women have. Thank you very much, Kirsty. And delegates, our next speaker, also speaking for the resolution, is Michelle Thompson, MSP. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, conference. Let me tell you a little story first of all. My mother was born in 1938. She was clever, but she was encouraged to take a job as a clerkess in a bank rather than go to university. She found that role really boring. And when she got married, she was told she should leave her job. And she then stayed home with three children. She was still bored, so did eventually go to university to study when I was five and my brothers were seven and nine. After she graduated, she found a job in an insurance company. Not her first preference, but choices were limited for her. I too was encouraged not to go to university, but instead become a clerkess, this time in a power company. I refused. I ha when I had my children, I worked part-time, even although I hardly had any money left over after my childcare. My mother and I are just one of the stories of a fragmented pattern of earning caused by the societal expectations of women. Women acting in good faith, believing they're valued by society, have chosen or been encouraged to forego earning power throughout the ages. The UK state pension is amongst the poorest in Europe. And for women born in the 1950s, the so-called waspy women, the injustice has been particularly unfair. The recent ruling that the Tory government failed to prepare the nearly 4 million women across the UK for what was described as a financially crippling state age pension increase is only the first step in their battle. Regrettably, we could be sure that the Tory government will drag their feet in their contractual obligations to these women. Conference, our SNP group fight hard for the voices of WASPy women to be heard in Westminster. The world of work has long been fragmented for women as many mothers choose to spend time with their children. The need for flexibility has also led to large differences in what women can expect if they have a private sector pension. The Pensions Policy Institute found men have substantially more private pension wealth than women, with the difference or the disparities increasing across age groups. For those aged 65 to 69, median pension wealth for men is just over £212,000 compared to just £35,000 for women. It's worse if you get divorced, and in my earlier example of women my mother's age, they would end up with nothing bar the state pension and the likelihood, even if they had worked, that their pensions would be far less. 
This COVID pandemic has seen some women stopping working altogether, many more becoming part-time, and we know more women are employed in the caring and hospitality professions that pay less, with many having the barest minimum of pensions offered. Without change, women of today will once again end up poorer in old age than men. The SNP are right to make the link between fairness, social justice and pensions. Having long called for the UK government to establish an independent savings and pension commission to ensure pension policies are fit for purpose, the Social Justice and Fairness Commission noted one of the key lessons of UK pension policy is the need to construct a long-term policy that doesn't chop and change. So the proposed Living Income Commission would include pension provision as part of its work to ensure secure living income for all throughout life. And the bigger picture is why, within the limited powers of devolution, the SNP has taken, taken steps to support women in their careers. Conference, it wouldn't be a surprise for you to know that I want to see more women running businesses. So I was personally delighted to see the proposal of a dedicated women's business centre in our manifesto. In my role on the economy and finance committees and as a vice convener of the cross-party group for women in business, I've been calling out that we need to see more private equity is only 1% at the moment going to women-led businesses. We need to make sure our public sector business agencies routinely factor in the implications of economic development policies for women. The expansion of free childcare to 1,140 hours is a game changer. I look forward with hope to the strategy for Scottish diversity and inclusion. And this will cover public sector, education, justice and the workplace. The barriers that women face I hope will be laid bare, such as systemic issues in our financial systems that consistently see women poorer. The call in this motion makes an important point. Human rights are at the heart of the social contract between an independent Scotland and our people. So our Scottish government will introduce a new human, human rights bill, which will incorporate Michelle, into Scotland's law a close? the UN Convention of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, last sentence, and woe betide any challenge from the Tory government against this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, and our final speaker also speaking for the resolution is Kat Carey from Edinburgh Central Branch. And just a wee reminder uh, to the delegates speaking um, on these resolutions that we do have a three minute time limit. So with that, welcome to Kat. Thank you. Conference, it has been widely reported that women have been hit harder economically during the COVID-19 pandemic. We took on more duties in the home, included home learning for those of us who have children, and we were more likely to get furloughed. This is something that gets mentioned often without delving deeper into the existing social inequalities that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed. Can you see it? Yes, there is a, wage, there is a gender wage gap. Yes, women who choose to have a family are at a disadvantage. Loss of wages, loss of promotion opportunities, and sometimes more insidious penalties like a change in a coworker's attitude. Yes, there are, few, there are fewer women in executive roles and in STEM fields, jobs that often pay more and have more job security than professions that are majority women. Employment laws have changed and society has progressed, but we are still a long ways away from equity. Conference, this is why this resolution is so important. For Scotland to realize its goals and live its values, we need to redress some of the inequalities of the past. Every woman stands on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. I know that women in their 50s and 60s had it a lot harder than I did, and I've always learned something when hearing about the different experiences that they've had and struggles when working inside or outside the home. And it is because of these efforts that I can still have a career and, the and be the mother of two young children. Although I didn't grow up in Scotland myself, I can safely tell you that this is a global truth and that and the more that we as the party that is the largest and strongest voice for independence strive for social justice and equity for all those who live here, the easier it is for us to make the case for independence. Just this morning, I was speaking with a colleague who remarked on how women become invisible as we age. 
and that there are different challenges that come with it. Older women should never be an invisible part of our society. Their contributions should never be ignored. Our society would not function without the contributions of women. They've done incredible amounts of essential unpaid labor and have had made enormous contributions to their communities with little to no recognition. We owe them this and a whole lot more if we wanna be the progressive, equitable, inclusive, independent country that we aim to be. Conference, this resolution seeks to address this. Passing this resolution would send a message to women who sometimes feel invisible that their struggles will not be forgotten and that their voices matter. To my son and my daughter, that they will grow up in a more equitable world. To me, that I will be a valued member of society who will not be forgotten. Because a society that takes care of its mothers and its grandmothers knows the value of them. I thank those who brought this motion forward. I applaud the efforts of all those who have put work into it. And I urge you all to join me in supporting it in the name of social justice, fairness, and the equal rights of women. Thank you very much, Kat, and thank you to all speakers on resolution number one. Kat was our final speaker, so we will move now to voting. And if I can ask you to look on your screens for your voting buttons, and please vote now.
Thank you very much, delegates. And for resolution one, which was entitled Financial Equality for Women, with 418 votes for and one against, the resolution passes overwhelmingly. And now, conference, we will move on to our second resolution, which is entitled Scotland, the Rehabilitation Nation. This resolution will be proposed by Colin Stomer of Edinburgh Central Branch, and Colin is a first time speaker, and seconded by Councillor Graham Campbell. So welcome to Colin and Graham. Conference, what if I told you that Scotland has a higher incarceration rate than most of Western Europe, higher than even England and Wales? What if I also told you that Scottish legal have warned that sentence lengths and custody rates continue to increase? What if I told you that we have a reconviction rate of nearly 30%? Would you conclude that we have a system that works? Conference, I don't want Scotland to be the incarceration nation, nor the reconviction nation. I want us to be the rehabilitation nation. When we have a system that is fundamentally broken, we should have the humility to look at other approaches that have been more successful. We should have the humility to listen. Listen to those people who have experienced the system. Livingston manager David Martindale is one such person. Today, he is an exemplar for rehabilitation and a role model to others wishing to turn their lives around. But having served time in Barlinny, he has useful insight to the challenges in the current system. He describes overcrowded prisons with hundreds of men trapped in a vicious crime cycle. He said jails were bursting at the seams. He talks of how some people are in prison just because they have free meals a day and a roof over their head, a shower and a place to sleep. They see no hope that their situation outside prison would be any better. Think about that for a second. Life outside prison better than freedom. Life inside prison better than freedom outside. This is a crucial point and it's key to why many reoffend. He says more should be done to support rehabilitation programs. Conference, I agree. I decided to delve a little deeper. I was curious as to why people were being imprisoned. The most common index offence group are violent offences, where I think most people would reasonably agree a custodial sentence is justified. We have to keep victims and wider society safe. However, when we delve deeper, we can see a not insignificant number being incarcerated for non-violent crimes. For example, housebreaking, theft, shoplifting, fraud, crimes against public justice, drugs, breach of the peace, and other miscellaneous offences. Conference, we appear to be jailing a sizable number for non-violent or even nuisance crimes. Nuisance crimes can cause significant distress to victims, but are we to believe that a custodial sentence is the only solution? Particularly when it's entirely plausible that an individual can be incarcerated for a nuisance crime, leave prison with a drug addiction, and then go on to reoffend in a more serious crime category. The examples and statistics are out there. Simply put, we are failing people particularly our young men in this country. Fundamental change is required, and we know there is a better way of doing things. Countries such as Finland are proof of this better way. A few decades ago, Finland had one of the highest rates of imprisonment in Europe. Then in the 1960s, researchers across the Nordic countries started investigating how much punishment really helps reduce crime. Here's a spoiler, it doesn't. Over the following three decades, Finland remade its penal policy bit by bit in a period of decarceration, which resulted in the lowest rates of imprisonment on the continent. They proved it was perfectly possible to drop the use of imprisonment by two thirds and not disturb the crime trend development. How did they do this? Finland worked to give people a gradual reintroduction into normal life, the kind offered by open prisons. A third of all Finnish inmates are housed in an open prison and statistically are less likely to be arrested again, with a 20% drop of reoffending rates. Furthermore, the commitment to abstinence from intoxicating substances and the strict control of them has helped prisoners kick addiction and lead healthier lives. Conference in a recent investigation by ITV called Inside Barlinny, one prisoner estimated that 90% of men in his halls were on drugs. If other countries can tackle this problem, why can't we? In the Finnish system, there's a real focus on participation in daily activities, according to abilities and wishes. Inmates can work, engage in vocational education, pursue rehabilitating activities. They can learn wood and metal work, agriculture, horticulture, even real estate maintenance. Some go on to work outside of the prison on day release, renovating historical buildings 
and maintaining conservation areas, receiving wages, wages that are liable for taxation. People will say this comprehensive approach must be more expensive. Conference, those people would be wrong. Um, in Finland, one day in an open prison costs 130 euros compared to 200 euros in a closed prison, a difference of 70 euros. Changing our system makes economic sense. Instead of ruining the lives of predominantly young men in our country, we can help them become happier, healthier, more productive members of society. There is a better way to do things, and we owe it to our people to deliver it. Thank you. I'm rising to support this resolution from Edinburgh Central because speaking from the Glasgow experience, we know from our community justice strategy that imprisonment doesn't work, that alternatives to custodial sentences work far better, and far more effective at providing restorative justice. We've been doing this for quite a while in Glasgow uh, and indeed since the 2008 report which uh, Henry McLeish uh, gave us, we know that imprisonment is not the answer, that we recommended that we would spend more money on addressing issues like addiction, uh, mental health crises, the crisis in, of people who've been in care and they are way overrepresented, and that providing a proper package to support them is the way to reduce overall offending and therefore reduce the need for people to be imprisoned. Uh, it's pretty clear then that we need some of the solutions, the radical solutions outlined, because seven and a half thousand people make Scotland in jail that is make Scotland one of the most imprisoning countries in Europe still we're still too close to the UK model so I'm arguing that we should follow a strategy that works a community justice strategy that we've proven in Glasgow and across the country works far more effectively at reducing offender behavior we know that from the lived experience of people who've been in jail who've been in and out and back again that their lived experiences tells us that restorative justice strategies work far more effectively let's do do that let's put our resources into that and not into prisons thank you very much graham and thank you very much colin our next speaker speaking in favor of this resolution is owen thompson mp owen is joining us audio only welcome to you owen thanks kirsten and uh, apologies uh, the joys of technology uh, first of all, I'd like to commend Edinburgh Central and uh, Thurzon District branches for bringing this resolution. I think we've heard a number of the key points uh, on the subject from the, the previous speakers, but to me, the, the core of this re resolution is a key point that's in our DNA as a party. We simply don't accept the I been mentality of so many of our opponents. When we see an issue that needs attention, we'll look for ways to address it, including looking for best practice from around the globe. This only goes to further highlight the tale of two countries that, while many Tories in Westminster continue to press for more draconian justice, virtually calling for offenders to be locked up in the key thrown away. No, not here in Scotland. We, we look for a different way of doing things. I know the Scottish Government are already working to produce a new national community justice strategy to promote alternatives to prison, moving the focus towards prevention. This is in all of our interests, as by tackling the cause of crime, we reduce crime. We've also seen the Scottish Government introduce a range of alternatives to custodial sentences as part of a move towards rehabilitative focused justice system. This has to be in the best interests of our communities and those who need the rehabilitation themselves. This is the best way forward for all. And while we might all ideally love to see a world where we no longer need prisons, the reality is, certainly for now, sometimes we will. So we need to make sure that our prisons are as good as they can be, which is why we see the Scottish Government investing in the prison estate. These are all steps to help us move towards a, a new way of looking for better outcomes, a, a, an evidence-based approach, which I think this, this, this resolution really puts at the centre uh, of our thinking. Uh, and I think the study asked for will really support the work that's already being undertaken by the Scottish Government. Let's make sure that we take this approach and so many of the issues that we tackle together. Let's let's look for new ideas. Let's not just let rest in our laurels because we're doing well. Let's continue to press ourselves. It will help us in justice in the same way that it will help us in our drive to independence. And for these reasons, conference, I'd ask you to, to support this resolution and urge you to carry that vote. Thank you very much, Owen. And Owen was our final speaker in favour of that resolution. We have no speakers in again, so we will now move to voting. 
So if I can ask you to locate your voting buttons and on resolution number two, please vote now. Thank you very much for that, delegates. And for resolution number two, which was entitled Scotland, the Rehabilitation Nation, with 435 votes for to 10 against, the resolution passes overwhelmingly.
So delegates, we will move then on to resolution number three. This resolution is entitled Ensuring Continued Links with the European Parliament and its Institutions. And this resolution is to be proposed by Councillor Heather Anderson and seconded by Councillor Christian Allard. So welcome to Heather and Christian. Scotland is a European nation and the SNP have stood up for Scotland in Europe for over 40 years. We have sent no less than eight SNP MEPs to the European Parliament, beginning with the mighty Winnie Ewing, who is still fondly referred to as Madame Ecosse. When he was first elected to the European Parliament in 1975 and served for 24 years. She was chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Culture and Education and she played a key part in the establishment of the Erasmus programme, which we now so sorely miss. IFA, our parliamentary group, regard Winnie as one of their founding mothers. Winnie was joined by Alan McCarthy and then followed by Ian Hudson, who served for 21 years. Ian was accompanied by Professor Neil McCormick and then for 15 years by our very own Alan Smith. Our final term was served by Aileen MacLeod and Christian Allard, and I was lucky enough to join them in December 2019. I am so honoured to have had a chance to play in the band. Our political home in the European Parliament is the Green EFA Alliance, the fourth largest political parliamentary group. EFA granted Aileen, Christian and I observer MEP status when we were sent into exile and together with the Friends of Scotland, they maintain close links with us and await our return. The European Free Alliance now represent 49 political parties across 19 states. EFA is committed to ensuring that all European stateless nations and regions have a voice in the European Parliament, and they have stood by us over the decades. And last time I checked, that's sadly what we still are, a temporarily stateless European nation, a sub-national actor. But please be assured, no one is fooled. Everyone is waiting for us to be a nation again. When I arrived in the European Parliament, I was humbled to be greeted so warmly and held so, clo so close. In Europe, unlike the UK, Scotland is held in very high regard. They see us as leaders and innovators, as good global citizens, as friends. Everyone knows who our First Minister is. Everyone knows our circumstances. Everyone wishes us well. They stand with us in solidarity. And as they say in Catalonia, solidarity is the tenderness of the people. And nothing could have shown just how ridiculous our subnational status is more than COP26. The world came to Glasgow, 197 heads of states and delegations came to Glasgow and our First Minister wasn't invited to the convention of the parties. However, you can't keep a good woman down. We all saw the photos with everyone who mattered. Iron brew and bowls were exchanged. World leader after world leader saw out our First Minister. They know our situation. They can understand our predicament and we can see before our eyes the regard Scotland is held in and the strength of our international presence. And nothing could have made the case for independence clearer than the way we were treated at COP. A country internationally recognised as a world leader in mitigating climate change was denied a place at the climate change table. A country who invented the concept of a just transition was shut out from the just transition negotiations. A country with a decision about whether or not a licence is granted for an oil rig in our waters is being made by another country. Please let me be clear on this point. It's Scotland's oil and it's staying in Scotland's ground. We welcomed the world to Glasgow as a nation in waiting. We know we have a democratic case for self-determination and so does the world. Europe is our home. They have kept the lights on for us. Terry Remke, Green MEP and Chair of our Friends of Scotland group, sent this message this morning. Terry says, now more than ever, we need to strengthen the ties between Scotland and Europe. We share common values and a vision for a greener, fairer and more equal society. 
especially in times when our democracies are under attack by authoritarian forces. We have to stand together to defend these values. Never forget, our door will always remain open. We want to build a future together with you. Thank you, Terry. Solidarity is indeed the tenderness of the people. So let's work with our friends. 62 countries have secured independence from the UK. Let's do this. Let's be the 63rd in 2023. Bonjour, conference. My thanks to fellow observer MEP Heather Henderson for moving this important motion today. Merci, Heather. Let me reassure you all that as former members, we are engaging with our friends and colleagues of the European Parliament. We are also participating to many events across the EU to ensure Scotland's voice is heard. Virtually, of course, the last 20 months with journalists in the media, with young people in universities, in discussion panels with other European politicians. Last month, I ventured to the continent for the first time to do just that. Don't tell my parents. I haven't seen them since the start of the pandemic. The city and region of Bordeaux wanted to know what ideas Scotland will bring in the conference on the future of Europe. For three days, I met young people and local politicians, telling them all about our vision of an independent Scotland in Europe. Next, I celebrated amongst friends the IFA's 40th anniversary in Brussels, in the heart of Europe. The president of the youth wing of the European Free Alliance was leading the IFA youth meetings. She's as Scottish as I am, our great Catalan new Scot, Valentina Cervera. Robin Graham, the National Secretary of the YSI, made a great contribution too. As you can see, we have really not left Europe. IFA, the EU are ready and expecting an independent Scotland to join them soon. It was an opportunity to remind our friends that our referendum will be held before the end of 2023. 2022 is before the end of 2023. I said to them, be ready next year just in case. Last year, we produced a leaflet to celebrate the SNP in Europe. COVID stopped and uh, our distribution, but if branches wants any of this leaflet, please let me know. The SNP has, stopped, has stood in Europe uh, for 40 years. Scotland is at the heart of Europe. From a state voting right to 16 years old and to all who live here, to our vision of a well-being economy, redefining what it means to be a successful nation in the 21st century. Now is the time for Scotland to prepare to return to Europe and to take our rightful place as a full member of the European Union. We have a common history and a common vision for the future. On October the 23rd, we celebrate the old alliance between Scotland and France, the oldest alliance in the world between two nations. In the words of the President of the French Republic, Vive l'Ecos Européenne. Thank you very much to Christian and thank you to Heather. And our next speaker speaking in favour of the resolution is Valentina Cervera Clavel of Pollock Shields East Branch. So welcome, Valentina. Hi, Christian. Thank you all for having me and thank you for Heather and, and Christian for inviting me to speak with them in this resolution. I thank them and also Eileen for the amazing work they've been doing representing us in Europe and being our voice even after, after Brexit. I'm currently joining you live from Venice because uh, I'm currently in a meeting bureau uh, with the European Free Alliance Youth. So this resolution comes quite at the perfect time. For me, this motion means a lot. International solidarity has been the foundation of my activism. I grew up listening to the stories of the Spanish Civil War and the international brigades, how people from the UK and Ireland came to Spain to fight even a war that wasn't theirs just because of their beliefs in democracy. I, as I grew older, international solidarity became the reason I ended up in Scotland. I grew up, I, I met a group of young Scots for independence activists in Catalonia, and I fell in love with your people, with your movement, and I just had to join in. Scotland is a European country. Scotland voted to remain. Unfortunately, the forceful contract 
that the UK has with us meant that we were taken away of the European Union against our will. But while we go, while we're working to come back, our links with the European Free Alliance youth need to grow stronger. Our allies, our neighbors in Europe are looking to help us and are working for us to be back. We can burn bridges with our European family. Every time I go to international events, people are amazed of the work the SMP are doing. Every time I have to speak or, into, or, or I'm invited to international meetings, it is an honor to explain and maybe to brag a little bit as well of the work the SMP and the Scottish government are doing. But it shouldn't be my place to be telling this. You know, it should be, I shouldn't be the voice of the SMP abroad. I'm, it's, it's not my place. This is why, apart from asking you to support this resolution, I ask for, a, I propose for the creation of an international officer in the SMP NEC. In YSI, I had the honor of being the first ever international officer. And as an NEC, things, it makes things 10 times easier. It can be that a party as big as the SMP, we don't have someone that is the representative, that is our voice to the rest of the world. Our international delegates are telling me, oh, the SMP doesn't even respond to our emails. And I'm sitting there, I have to apologize on our behalf. And, and sometimes I think, well, sometimes we don't even respond to our own members' emails and complaints. And it's, I understand we have so many members. Maybe it's time to create this position so someone can take charge and be our voice and our direct contact with the rest of international communities. Conference, while we work towards an independent and more equal Scotland, we need to share our good practices. We need to tell the world how good we're doing and our equality policies. We cannot be achieving an independent Scotland in a more equal one when in the rest of the world, some communities don't even have access to their basic, to their basic needs. Scotland Conference, please support this resolution. Let's get our links with Europe stronger. Let's bring back Scotland to its rightfully place in the European Union. So are Alba and Visca Catalunya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valentina. And delegates, our next speaker, also speaking for the resolution, is Claire Adamson, MSP. Welcome, Claire. Thank you very much, Kirsten, and uh, a warm welcome to everyone to conference today. Hi. It's wonderful to be here. I'd like to extend an invitation to Valentina to come to my constituency and see our wonderful monument to the International Brigade and those heroes from Lanarkshire who lost their lives in the Spanish Civil War. It was vandalised with fascist graffiti last year and it's just a reminder to all of us how precious our hard fought for democratic rights are and how important our links with Europe are to maintain those. Scotland has a proud tradition of strong cultural trading links with Europe. From the Wallace and de Murray Lebec letter of 1297 through the old alliance to the Erasmus exchange program established by Winnie Ewing, Madame Ecosse, we have I been an outward looking nation with a hand of friendship to our European neighbours. We now find ourselves torn out of that union against our, our will with Brexit chaos worsening by the day. Erasmus, free movement of people, trade relations, well-being objectives, initiatives like farm to fork, and East EU citizenship, the list of those rights denied to us goes on and on. As convener of the Scottish Parliament Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee, my work is dominated by these issues, issues each and every day. Our democratic deficit is cemented as we cut our government, our government is cut out of and excluded from the UK and EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement forums and committees. And no Scottish Parliament delegates are able to join the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly with Europe, even when negotiations and discussions are in devolved areas. This is the biggest threat to our Parliament that we have faced and underlines all the more why we need independence and a place at the top table in Europe. This is why it is vital we, we all do everything that we can to keep and grow the links and networks that we have built over the years. 
Our manifesto, Scotland's Future, Scotland's Choice, pro promised that over the course of the next Parliament, we would maintain and strengthen Scotland's relationship with other EU partners with a view to rejoining as an independent nation as soon as possible. We are keeping Scotland aligned with European law. And Angus Robertson said in a recent appearance to my committee, alignment will ease the future process of Scotland's return to the Europe European Union. And while we keep aligned, the UK is reviewing current EU law, including, it seems, imperial measurement. They have become the very definition of a pound land government. That is why we must use every opportunity available. Our incredible cultural offering must be brought to bear in diplomacy. Our city and town links from twinning must be maintained. And why Scotland House, Brussels, London, Paris and Dublin will now be joined by international offices planned in Copenhagen and Warsaw. We will facilitate these links and let our EU colleagues know that Scotland has not left you. And yes, please, EU, leave a light on for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And delegates, our final speaker speaking for the resolution is Elena Whittam, MSP. Welcome to Elena. Good afternoon, friends. Conference. We cannot fail to see that people, businesses and communities are now paying a heavy price for hard Brexit that we never voted for, imposed by a Tory government we certainly never voted for. The recent catastrophic fuel, labour and food shortages have been directly caused by Tory UK government policy failures and Brexit planning and crisis management. And the most vulnerable in society are suffering hugely as a result. Brexit Britain is broken. It's run by a hard right Tory government and Labour is no real opposition at all. Conference, the people of Scotland voted to decisively remain within the European Union and the SNP firmly believe that EU membership is the best option for an independent Scotland. Close relations with the European Parliament form a key part of the wider SNP aim to return to the EU as an independent member state. And we know that the SNP have enjoyed a long history of work in the European Parliament, and we've had continual representation in Brussels between the first direct EU election in 1979 and the UK's sad withdrawal from the EU in January 2020. And Winnie Ewing was our first MEP, as we've heard, and became known, known in Brussels as Madame Ecosse. Maybe that should be Mama Ecosse. And we can never forget Alan, Alan Smith's impassioned plea to the EU to leave a light on for Scotland. Conference, the SNP remains a member party of the European Free Alliance, despite the fact Brexit no longer allows us representation in the EU Parliament. And it is also the case that the SNP remains committed to Scotland's place in Europe. And the European Parliament remains interested in Scotland's future as a progressive, internationalist Northern European country. And a great amount of sympathy for and interest in Scotland has been expressed by MEPs across political parties. Since January 2020, the European Friends of Scotland group has served as an informal network of MEPs representing different political groups of the European Parliament with the objective of helping to facilitate dialogue on specific areas of mutual interest and to assure as close a relationship as possible between Scotland and the EU post-Brexit. Conference, Europeans are leaving a light on for Scotland. Support across Europe is for an independent Scotland joining the EU is high. So let us use that strong message in our campaign for independence and get the job done. Et à nos amis en Europe, je vous en prie, gardez la lumière allumée. On va retourner. Ça sera pas long. Conference, I urge you to support the motion. Thank you very much, Elena. And that was our final speech for resolution number three, delegates. So we will now move on to voting. So if I can ask you to please locate your voting buttons and please cast your votes now.
Thank you very much, delegates. And for resolution number three, which was entitled Ensuring Continued Links with the European Parliament and its Institutions, with 462 votes for and 12 against, the resolution passes overwhelmingly. So, conference, let's move on now to resolution number four, which is entitled Women's Safety. And to propose this resolution, we have Robin Graham of YSI and West Kilbride branch. And to second the resolution, Maria Mackay of YSI and Dingwall and District branch. And Maria is a first time speaker at conference. So welcome to Robin and Maria. Hello conference, I am delighted that this resolution has made the agenda and I'm pleased to be proposing it today during this year's 16 days of activism against gender based violence. I appreciate for some this will be a difficult and sensitive topic and I would like to give advance warning of that. Right now the world is a terrifying place to be a woman. The news is constantly punctuated with horrifying stories of violence against women and girls. Only a few months ago we were shocked by the heartbreaking murder of Sarah Everard and disgusted by the horrific details which emerged during the sentencing of the Metropolitan Police Officer who killed her. We feel scared and are angry that this is a reality. For ourselves, for our friends, for our mothers, our daughters and sisters. Gender-based violence encompasses a whole spectrum of behaviour which has a heavily gendered aspect as it is most often perpetuated against women and girls. However, it's important to acknowledge that members of the LGBTQ plus community and some men are also at increased risk. I commend the work of the Scottish Government in taking action to tackle gender-based violence. They have recognised that there's a range of damaging behaviour and have introduced world-leading legislation regarding domestic abuse, coercive and controlling behaviour. When young people leave home for the first time, uh, for most people, it's an exciting and new experience. But it's also the time where we're first properly exposed to the world and dangerous situations. Research from Revolt Sexual Assault in 2018 found that a staggering 62% of students have experienced sexual assault at UK universities. But only 6% of them reported it to the police and only 6% reported it to the university. Making a disclosure of an experience of gender-based violence takes incredible strength and courage, and it's essential that this information is dealt with professionally and appropriately. The Pink Card Scheme is an initiative from Emily Test, where cards are distributed which detail specialist services so that staff can effectively deal with disclosures of gender-based violence. Really important work has been done to raise awareness of these specialist services where people can turn to if they need support, but no authority and figure should lack that basic information they need to provide survivor-centred support. Over 100,000 copies of the Emily Chess Pink Cards are now in circulation in our universities and colleges. These cards complement the rest of the work being taken by universities, colleges and the government and are by no way means a substitute for first responder or bystander treatment. We call on the government to continue working hard to make Scotland a safer place, especially for women and girls, and extend the rollout of the Pink Card initiative to encompass all staff working in education and frontline emergency services, whilst continuing other forms of education and treatment. Please support the resolution. Hello conference. As a current law student of Aberdeen University myself, this motion hits close to home and I am appreciative to be seconding it and speaking on a very topical subject. I find too many parallels between Emily and myself and feel that action must be taken to improve the situation for young women in higher education. Rape Crisis Scotland shared the harrowing statistic that one in 10 women in Scotland will experience rape and one in five women in Scotland have had someone attempt to make them have sex against their will. By definition, gender-based violence describes a variation of behaviour including unwanted comments, harassment, stalking, physical and emotional abuse, sexual assault and murder, and is inclusive that both men and LGBTQ plus members can also be victims as well. Sexual assault is all too common. 
we need people to know who to turn to if they have something to disclose. There are already a lot of university halls, toilet store dolls and clubs and student unions that have materials raising awareness on people and organisations that are available to contact. I commend the Scottish Government in its Don't Be That Guy campaign as it effectively illustrates the spectrum of damaging behaviour that makes women uncomfortable such as catcalling, whistling and guilt tripping. What we need now though is the assurance that if someone is brave enough to come forward and make a disclosure of any sexual violence or assault that it will be dealt with appropriately in a survivor-centred way. The death of Sarah Everard really shocked the nation. No one should be afraid of the people that are supposed to be there for our safety. We need to ensure that if survivors want to disclose any information that they have someone that they can fully trust to be professional, confident and supportive. The pink card scheme isn't a substitute for continuing work and systematic change. However, just one tool just to add into this combating the issue. I call on the government to work closely with Emily Test to ensure a smooth national rollout of the pink card scheme. I call a new conference to support this resolution. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you, Robin. Delegates next to speak in favour of the resolution, we have Co Councillor Adam McVie. Welcome, Adam. Thank you very much and apologies, I was uh, not quite ready there. Um, thank you very much to the YSI colleagues for bringing this motion forward. Um, I think last speaker said uh, some brilliant actions have been effectively tackling uh, gender-based violence. Um, and I'm tempted, conference to speak about the actions of the council that I lead, I'm tempted to talk about the progressed um, additional support for those experiencing domestic abuse or outstanding partnership work between the council and police, um, very well led by SNP councillor Amy McNeese-Making. But I, I want really to talk in another capacity. Gender-based violence shouldn't be a women's issue. It's a man's issue. It's not about what women wear. It's not about what women say. It's not about how they behave. It's not about who a woman's in a relationship with how long she leaves her drink unattended in a club. This is all about the behavior of men towards circumstances. And um, so we need to keep a laser focus uh, on that. We've all heard new fathers gushing about their daughters and saying that their perspective has changed after they had a daughter. And that's because there's an epiphany moment for some, when men suddenly realise the hostile world that their daughters are going to have to navigate. But if we are to tackle this issue properly, it's not about how we raise our daughters, it's about how we raise our sons. I pledge never to commit, condone or remain silent about men's violence against women in all its forms. That's a pledge I've made and it's a White Ribbon Scotland pledge. And I hope those words are familiar to a lot of people who are listening. I hope there's a lot of people listening who have signed up to that pledge. But conference, this is 16 days of action. We are two days in. So I'm encouraging everyone as well as supporting this motion to take action over the next fortnight. Please back this motion. Sign the White Ribbon Scotland pledge if you haven't already. The Don't Be That Guy campaign has been hugely effective at showing what not to be, but I'm really asking everybody to think about, well, asking the men to think about what kind of guy you want to be, what kind of world you want uh, the women that you care about to live in and take action to try and deliver that. So have those awkward conversations. It's okay to be awkward. It's okay to have conversations with friends and family that are challenging for everybody, because if we're not to condone um, violence against women, if we're to show this uh, the door and end it properly, it requires us all to have that inbuilt strength in leadership and hopefully get to a point where we don't have to have a conversation about how 
uh, will let certain streets are because safety is genuinely for everyone and there is no difference in the um, in the experience of people just because of their gender. This is about how men tackle this issue and it's a men, man's issue to resolve. So my plea conference is a call to arms. This is 16 days of action and men need to spend the next two, two weeks talking about this issue, taking action against this issue and building a better world for them, their daughters and the women that we care about in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. And delegates, our final speaker on this resolution, also speaking in favour of the resolution, is Jenny Minto, MSP. Welcome to Jenny. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. And good afternoon, conference. And I'd also like to pass my thanks on to the YSI and the Thurso and District Branch for bringing this very important resolution to conference. Yesterday marked International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, launching 16 days of activism, as Robin and Adam have just said. Nearly one in three women have been abused in their lifetime. In times of crisis, the numbers rise, as seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. And to raise awareness, this year's theme is Orange the World, End Violence Against Women. Now, Orange represents a brighter future free of violence against women and girls. Yesterday afternoon, I attended a reception for the finalists of the 2021 Scottish Police Federation Awards, where I met the police officers whose bravery was being recognised. One was a police officer from Argyll and Butte, who recognised, sorry, who rescued, then protected a woman from an attack perpetrated by a man inside the woman's own home, then waited for backup, which was over an hour away. The police officer was a woman. We talked about women's safety. We talked about walking in well-lit streets. We talked about always being vigilant. We talked about Sarah Everard. The dreadful murder of Sarah Everard in the most appalling circumstances has exposed the pervasive and corrosive nature of men's violence against women. Violence against women and girls is one of the most devastating and fundamental violations of human rights and cannot be tolerated. I am pleased that the SNP government recognises this and is providing funding to support services combating violence against women and girls. As part of the SNP's 100-day commitment, the Scottish Government has already invested an additional £5 million in supporting frontline organisations which tackle domestic abuse and sexual violence to deal with additional pressures that have occurred during the pandemic. But tragedy can also spur us into action. And as Mary said, the tragic story of Emily Druitt, who took her own life after being a victim of abuse and violence at the hands of her boyfriend. Her mother, Fiona, created the Emily Test Pink Card Scheme for all frontline emergency service staff and staff working in education. More than 100,000 cards have been distributed to every college and university in Scotland since 2018. As Fiona said, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we have lost Emily and it cannot help her now. But it can help ensure no other family goes through this. Every day, women are subjected to abuse, harassment and violence. The time to tackle these scars on our society is now. Rolling out the Emily Test Pink Cards is an important part of supporting those who need help. Conference, please support this motion. Thank you very much for that, Jenny. Now, delegates, let's move to our vote on this resolution, which is resolution number four, women's safety. So if I can ask you to please locate your voting buttons and please vote now.
Thank you very much, delegates. So with that, we just await the results of the vote on resolution four. And these are 464 votes for and two against, meaning that that resolution passes overwhelmingly. So delegates, let's move on now to resolution number five, which is entitled glyphosate. And that resolution will be proposed by Gordon Scanlon and seconded by Marina Scanlon, both from Clydebank branch and both first time speakers at conference. So welcome both of you. Conference notes that whilst glyphosate is the world's most widely used pesticide, it has a significant long lasting impact to both human health and the environment. This motion as well, friends, serves as a tribute to one of our dear friends in the Claybank branch, Eric MacArthur. Eric was a long-standing member. He was a world-class and a world-renowned beekeeper. Eric had so much passion for the environment, for human and animal life. He was also an academic. And this, is, this motion is something that Eric was really, really passionate about and something that he, 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 tried, to, he tried to pass to, to conference numerous times. Uh, and uh, Eric tragically lost his life uh, just this past summer. But this motion isn't purely about sentiment. This motion, I think, is practical. It is something that is really important for uh, the environment and for uh, our food chain. Conference understands that glyphosate that is having a direct impact on climate change due to the harm it is causing to biodiversity by making ecosystems more vulnerable to pollution and climate change. There is evidence that suggests that herbicides containing glyphosate are having negative effects on the environment both directly and indirectly. This includes indirect impacts that this weed killer is having by destroying habitats and food supplies. This is then indirectly impacting the delicate balance of the wider food chain. Furthermore, Glyphosate has also been found to have adverse effects on earthworms, beneficial uh, uh, insects and on bees. As we know, bees are vital to both pollinate the food we need to survive and pollinate many of the trees and flowers that provide habitats for wildlife. The conference acknowledges that glyphosate is found on many of our products that we eat. It has also been found in water, wine and beer. Studies have found that glyphosate-based herbicides can interfere with various organs and biochemical pathways in mammals. This can lead to gen toxicity and endocrine uh, disruption, which can lead to chronic health and development effects. Conference calls upon the Scottish Government to conduct a study investigation into the harm that glyphosate is having both uh, human health and the environment with the long-term aim. If results show negative findings, then herbicide should be banned from use and from general sale to the public. I would also uh, like to allay the concerns of many in the agriculture uh, industry that I've sp spoken to, who have uh, brought up concerns that perhaps there's not alternatives or what could be used to replace um, the use of glyphosate with. And I completely understand those concerns. And that's why I think that it is so important that this motion isn't just calling for an outright ban, but is also calling for a review into uh, the process of how we could uh, replace glyphosate. Conference, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to second this motion on glyphosate, which has been brought forward by the Clybank branch. Glyphosate is the world's most widely used herbicide, more commonly known as Roundup. Roundup is one of the UK's most popular weed killer brands. While glyphosate, glyphosate sorry, herbicides are the most widely used herbicide in UK agriculture, the overall use of glyphosate has increased dramatically in the past 20 years. However, studies have proven that it has a significantly negative impact on both human health and the environment. Conference believes that the resulting high exposure to glyphosate to the public is a significant issue. There is currently increasing concern about glyphosate, impacts in human health, Studies have suggested that long-term exposure to glyphosate has been found to have links to various health issues such as cancer, liver and kidney damage. The World Health Organization's Cancer Agency, IERC, has stated that herbicide is a probable, this herbicide is a probable toxin. 
Additionally, in 2016, a joint report by the World Health Organization and the UN showed that there was some evidence of a positive association between glyphosate exposure and the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The manufacturers of glyphosate have paid compensation to settle a large number of legal cases, alleging that the herbicide caused non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Glyphosate-based product has been subject to about 125,000 lawsuits over its allegedly hazardous effects. Conference proposes that the Scottish Government invoke the precautionary principle when considering the authorisation of pesticides and other potentially harmful agricultural chemicals. It is time Scotland makes a commitment to conduct a review of the use of glyphosate in public and private use. Many other European countries have already taken to ban the use of products that contain glyphosate. Austria has largely banned the use of glyphosate and in Portugal, use of glyphosate is prohibited in all public spaces. And the president of the Portuguese Medical Association has also called for a worldwide ban on the herbicide. Luxembourg is gradually introducing a complete ban of all products containing glyphosate and restrictions have been put in place on its use across several other countries, including Italy, Netherlands and the Czech Republic, whilst France and Germany are planning to phase out its use by 2023. To conclude, Conference recognises that in the light of concern for human health due to contamination and in the medium to long term interest of safeguarding the health of the population of Scotland, as well as the health of our agricultural food production infrastructure, that effective protective measures should be put in place. Therefore, I support the aims I laid out in the motion being brought forward and the call for the Scottish Government to conduct a clear review of impartial research and learn from successful prohibition as achieved in other European countries. Thank you very much, Marina, and thank you very much, Gordon. Our final speaker on this resolution and also speaking for the resolution is Susie MacDonald of Gilmerton Branch. So welcome to Susie. Thank you for bringing this motion forward and thank you for having me as a speaker. Um, this motion is something that feels kind of close to my heart of um, have, between having a garden and, and feeling kind of um, uh, very um, passionate about environmental things. I've noticed over the years that um, there's less bees noticed in the garden, which I feel is partly due to the amount of the glyphosate and other herbicides being used around. And in general, I feel there would be other solutions to using that. Um, and as well to go and because of the um, amount of harm that's already been talked about to the environment, to people, to the bees and, and other uh, animals. Um, it's apart from what's already been mentioned, it has been found even in breast milk because it's going into the water system. And it's something that um, should be really um, thoroughly looked in for getting a ban. I kind of shudder every time I go anywhere, um, got centers, supermarkets, and see it still on the shelves. Because there are alternatives that can be used by removing it and as well, the, the spraying of it, putting it early onto wheat and oats might have the additional effects of um, people having other um, allergies, illnesses, and so forth. Um, I fully agree with this motion and um, hope conference can fully support it, that hopefully a ban will get implemented sooner rather than later and alternatives are going to be found for it um, that can hopefully look at something more environmentally friendly instead of the herbicide that's at presently used by councils and farmers elsewhere. Thank you for speaking. Thank you very much for that, Susie. And Susie was our final speaker on this resolution. So we'll now move to a vote. So we're voting on resolution number five, which is entitled glyphosate. So if I can ask you to please locate your voting buttons, delegates, and please vote now.
Thank you very much, delegates. So for resolution five, which was entitled glyphosates, the resolution passes overwhelmingly with 407 votes for and 28 against. And that was our final resolution for this first session of conference. But before you go, delegates, can I remind you all to have a look at the fringe events. You'll see more information about these in your programme and you'll find them on the left hand side of your screen. These run all the way through conference. If you can also have a look at your email, Earlier today, you will have had an email containing the link to an online ballot for office bearer and committee positions. So if you can have a look at that so you can cast your votes and best of luck to all the candidates. And of course, the amazing SNP blether function, which you'll also find on your left hand side is open. So you will have the opportunity to spend your Friday evening blethering with SNP friends old and new. So do enjoy your evening and I look forward to seeing you all bright and breezy tomorrow morning at 10.30 for our next session.